Please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. All right, I'm dedicating this entire Soapbox Sunday video here today to debunking tube snake oil myths that, ex that are out there, okay? And so let's have some fun with this. Topic number one. Uh, the topic is basically there are no good tubes that are newly made in the industry, right? If you want a good tube, you're going to have to go find some piece of uh, some vintage tube from years ago. Maybe a, a telephone kind of Siemens, a Mazda, a Mullard, whatever. But that they don't make good tubes anymore. And I'm here, I, I totally believe that's a bunch of BS. I've used... I mean, I, you guys all know I've got a couple hundred thousand tubes in my collection, and um, I played them all. I've used, I mean, you, you name the 12AX7, I've probably used it. And um, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good vintage tubes out there, and they come with a hefty price tag. Whether you're buying Amprex or Mullard or you name it, that, you know, these things for a 12X7 may be $40, $50, $60 or more a piece, right? And I'm a firm believer that for $15 or under, you can get some really good new um, 12AX7 tubes. Personally, I am a fan of the Sovtech 12AX7 LPS tubes, okay? I would love to do a blind listening test. I've got a, a, a AR SP3 preamp over here on my bench that I personally use to listen to stuff in my office here. And I have ran it with a full complement of vintage telefunkins in it, and a long plate, long smooth plate telefunkins. I've also ran it with a full complement like it's running right now with these um, Sovtech tubes. And I'm betting you in a blind listening test, no one could tell me which one was which. And I think they both sound great. Um, so you find these things here. Right? The, uh, this is uh, Antique Electronic Supply. I got these things here for, for $13 or less, right? Uh, it's good value for the money. I've been using them in gear I've built and restored now for probably 10 years. And um, I've had... I've had very low failure rate, if almost not any, and I, they, they just perform well. You guys know I built a unit a while back to um, to specifically test n noise in tubes, uh, whether they're microphonic or whether they've um, you know they just got thermal noise or whatnot. Uh, when I was selling tubes, and uh, so I kind of made this proprietary device. Maybe one day I'll make a video about that uh, that device, but. Um, but I've, I've tested a bunch of these 12AX7 LPSs with um, with um, that device. Very, all of them, very, very low noise. Um, and there's some other good ones out there. I think the new Gold, gold Lions and some others are, are good. So I'm going to debunk this. I think there are good new tubes made. And, and in many cases, I think they're as good, if not maybe better, than some of the old vintage stuff. So don't get wrapped up into it. you got to go back in time 40 years, 50 years, and buy some old vintage stuff that um, to actually have good sound out of your gear. It's just my belief system and I'm sticking to it. All right, tube topic number two, we're gonna debunk here and this is tube burn in. Now, listen, I get the question a lot. Do I need to let my tubes burn in? Will they sound better after 20 hours or 100 hours or whatever? And while there are a lot of electronic components that I do think burn in adds value, um, phono cartridges. I don't think there's anybody in the industry that would debate that one. They kind of settle in and sound better. It's more of a mechanical thing, but you know, 20 hours into a, a cartridge may sound a lot better than uh, right out of the box. Um, capacitors, coupling capacitors. I do believe as you apply voltage to those, they're electrochemical device. They continue to shape and form somewhat. They may uh, sound slightly different or smooth out or whatever after 20 hours or more, 100 hours, whatever, than they do brand new. Um, however, when it comes to vacuum tubes, if you kind of look at the physics and the mechanical structures behind vacuum tubes, I struggle to come up with anything that's there that really, over time as it burns in, gets better. Possibly, possibly, um, kind of the substrate that is emitting the electrons um, you know, off the cathode. Maybe. I, I, I've never been able to tell it with my ear. I put a tube in brand new out of the box, listen to it, I listen to it 100 hours in, I can't really tell the difference. Now, what may happen? You, let's say you put a tube in and it sounds one way, 
And then 2,000 hours later, it sounds a little different. Well, yeah, that tube is wearing out. It's getting weaker. And maybe that weaker sound is a little softer to you. Maybe it sounds better. So, so maybe. But in general, I think the answer is no. Tubes are not a device where burn-in really changes much about them. And uh, I don't think it's warranted. I think you drop a new set of tubes in, you have the opportunity for them to sound great. So it's my belief system. I'm sticking to it. Let's roll on to number three here. All right, let's talk a little bit more about snake oil here. Um, so cryo-treated vacuum tubes. There's this concept out there where basically you take a vacuum tube and you put it into a unit that is designed to freeze it down very, very cold, near sub-zero or whatnot, right? And in doing that, you actually change the, the metal structure um, making up the tubes, right? And in doing that, somehow you improve the overall performance of this tube, right? So I'm just calling that's a bunch of friggin' bullshit. And, and I'd love to get into a deep physics debate with anybody who says it's not, right? So here's the deal, okay? One, even if you did freeze it down to that level and you started to reshape the, uh, the physical structure of the... Uh, the atoms and whatnot in this metal doesn't necessarily mean you've restructured in them in a better way, okay? Um, now, I will agree, you, anybody that's gone through any kind of uh, physics class and you learn about absolute zero and you freeze stuff all the way down to absolute zero, say a copper wire, all of a sudden you reach something called superconductivity and all of a sudden there's no resistance to the wire whatsoever. All that is true. The problem is you can't get to the absolute zero because to get to absolute zero, you have to have something colder than absolute zero to get you there. Uh, otherwise, we would have we would have um, wires the size of maybe hairs, um, threads feeding the electrical out, you know, into our house if we could keep it frozen. The problem is you can't keep it frozen that cold. So superconductivity is more of a theory than a reality. Um, that you could practically play out. It's the same dang thing with these tubes. You freeze these things all the way down. Even if I bought into you change some of the uh, the structure, all of a sudden, as soon as you warm the tubes back up, mm, maybe that structure changes back, right? But people love to buy bull in the audiophile hobby. That what they, what it comes down to is, I want the best. I want the absolute best, and I'm willing to pay whatever it takes to get that. So. If you show me a pair of tubes here, this is a match pair of Gold Lion um, 12AX7s, which by the way, are a great set of tubes, okay? $92.40 because they've been cryo-treated. Check this out, okay? Exact same set of tubes from another seller here, match pair, have not been cryo-treated, $61.75. So, kind of take that into account. What is that? That's $31 that someone is getting for cryo treating some tubes of yours. Well, let me ask you this. How do you even know they froze your tubes? Okay. Maybe they just put a little, a few were a few four letters in the title of their of their auction here. And all of a sudden you're buying some tubes that were supposedly frozen at some point in time. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. You have no way to prove that. Um, so you you gotta have traced and you gotta have faith in this snake oil snake oil salesman, okay? I'm just saying, and maybe these people are freezing these things. Maybe in their heart of heart, they believe they're making these things sound better. I think it's a bunch of bull, personally. So uh, I will get off my soapbox on this topic. If you bought cryovac tubes and you think they sound better, betting your money is the placebo effect. is not reality. But um, hey, if you're happy at the end of the day and you spent more money and you think you've got something that's better and you're happy with that, then that's all that really matters. And you can take my comments and throw them out the window. I'm just telling you for, for my friends out there that have not bought cryovac tubes but might be considering it, please don't. You're wasting your money. All right, I'm going to jump off my soapbox and on to the next topic. All right, up next on my list of total BS tube-related snake oil items would be something called tube dampers. Here they are. You've, you've all seen them. I mean, there are, uh, look at this. There are just tons and tons and tons uh, of them out there. And um, right, before I dive into why they're a bunch of BS, um, I will I will give this little caveat. There could be, could be, 
a certain special scenario where maybe these things add a little bit of value. Like maybe if your hi-fi is operating in the uh, cab of your 18-wheeler, or maybe you fly a, 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 a Piper Cub um, plane or something and your hi-fi system's in there. But for the average person that has their hi-fi unit sitting on a shelf in their house, this is total BS. L let me tell you why. A couple of reasons, okay? First and foremost, the things that we call mi calls microphonics, which is ultimately kind of the moving and vibrating of the little, uh, you know, the grids, the screens, the, uh, the physical components inside of your tubes, right? And as those little things move, um, then, you know, they, um, they, they cause a form of feedback and it ends up being microphonics. This happens much more so in guitar amps, especially ones where the speaker is built into the same cabinet as the tube. So what happens is as the speaker moves, it, it makes vibrations, which ultimately feeds back through the chassis and moves the little grids and uh, screen elements inside the tube, which kind of forms a... a, a you know, a type of feedback, and um, it's called microphonics. And um, so tubes that have better internal structures, you know, uh, more solid and, and, uh, and uh, rigid will um, perform better in those scenarios than, than maybe others. However, putting a rubber ring, or, <laughs> or you see all these things here, on the outside of your glass envelope, has very little to do with the things inside of your tube actually moving or not. And, and, and I would dare say it doesn't help one bit. So that's kind of reason number one. Um, it, you know, it just it doesn't apply. Two, um, you're putting something on the outside of the glass of your tube envelope. And ultimately what you're doing is you're hindering the cooling of the tube. These things were designed um, for the glass envelope to you know, dissipate heat. And so let's just wrap some stuff around them, you know, kind of like, let me go put a coat on and let's just hold all that heat in. That's going to be great for your tubes. So I just find this whole topic, you know, just hilarious. And it, and it gets, it gets even deeper. Some of the, I mean, some of these things are finely machined devices that are wrapped around and look like heat sinks, but they got little rubber rings inside of them. It, it, it all goes back to people are willing to spend more money to get the best. And so if I spend more money, ultimately this must be better, right? And at the end of the day, I think you're spending money on total BS. And by the way, if you think I'm wrong and you wanna go out and, and buy some of these tube dampers, one, do not go on eBay or any of these audio websites and buy these little rubber rings, okay? They're gonna charge you like 10, 9, 10, $12 a piece for these rings. Take your tube down to your local auto parts store and say, hey, I need, I need some neoprene um, rubber gaskets and something that would fit on this. And you're going to pay about 89 cents for one of those things, maybe even less. So uh, if you believe in them, at least get them cheaper. But some of these things, look, let me show you this one. Just so you know, I'm not picking on any one company's tube dampers. I'm picking on all friggin' tube dampers. Let me read you these words here. Tube dampers. Virtually all vacuum tubes are prone to distortion caused by microphonic vibrations. I don't disagree. I just think putting something on the outside of the glass envelope doesn't help that one bit. To overcome audible distortions, a titanium C-ring holds microphonic absorbing pads against the vacuum tube bulb. The tube sound is made more clear and precise, less fuzzy, and less harsh. Tonal qualities are rendered much more true and natural. Subtle passages are more distinguishable from the deepest space through the highest frequencies. Bullshit. Okay, I gotta bleep that out, but BS. Okay, I, I don't know what to say on this stuff. All right, all these items that I call kind of snake oil tube things, it really comes down to I think people have spent good hard-earned money on their system and it sounds good to them and they love it they're just you know it's always like okay what can i do to take it to the next level right what what, what can i do oh there's some tube dampers for fifty dollars i'm willing to throw another fifty dollars at my system right um and you know so people just inch up a little bit oh look at those speaker cables i wonder if those would sound better you know 
Um, I, I've told people for years, okay, um, where your where the, will make the most difference in your sound system is one the thing that originates your audio. So let's just say you're a turntable person, sink your money into your cartridge, okay? As long as you've got a decent table, cartridge will make the biggest difference, okay? Then kind of go, the stuff in the middle to me, mm, it makes a difference, but not as much as the stuff on the ends. Your speakers, spend your money on your speakers or the thing that's, that originates your sound. In my opinion, that's where your money's best spent. Save up. Save that $50. Save that $100 you were going to spend on audio cables. Save that $300 you were going to spend on that power cable that will do absolutely not one frigging thing for you. I could go on this snake oil rant for, for days. Um, spend, it, spend it on your speakers. I promise you, it'll make, it, it'll make the biggest difference. Um, no one demand. I see, I've gone to people's houses before and they've got like this $2,000 tube amp sitting there. They've got tube dampers all over this thing. They got these all sorts of fancy um, supports that I know they spent $100, $200 on to hold their tube amp up in the air. Um, they've got this, you know, granite slab underneath their turntable. There, there is a little bit to that one, maybe. But um, you know, they spent all this money here, and then I look over here, and they've and they've got like a set of two hundred and fifty dollar Infinity speakers from the nineteen eighties, and I'm like, like, throw all this junk in the middle of the way, get you a, I don't know, some kind of mid range stuff, and sink your money into your endpoints. It's just just what I believe in. Anyway, I'm, I know I'm going to get bashed and smashed and thrashed over this post, and, and I don't really give a <laughs> to be honest. It's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. If, if you believe in some of what I believe in, good. If not, at least you've been warned. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching this uh, long and uh, maybe ranting video.